I remember the first time ever hearing that song, I know for me, just as a college student, uh, listening to that song, open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, and hearing uh, that, just the simple words of it, reminding what is, what is the most valuable thing to have Jesus there right in front of us. And I remember being in my college dorm room and being alone and, almost, and just kind of saying, Lord, if you want to appear right now to me, yeah, I don't even have to tell anybody. Boy, just, and, and that sense of, Vince, would you believe more if you saw me and be, ah, I believe. Boy, I, I, I probably, would, it would do, so, you know, that, that sense of, and just being reminded of Jesus saying, yes, Thomas, you've touched me, but blessed are they who have not seen me and yet believe. And I just said, you're right, Lord, just increase my faith, increase my faith. Make it that you are just as real to me as if you appeared to me. And over the last 35 years, Jesus has been faithful in that regard. I invite you to open up today to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. I don't know how many of you have been following along this, what, what I think has been quite a riveting story of these 12 soccer boys from Thailand that were... Busy with activity, right? It's amazing how you can be, your life can be filled with activity and you don't realize that danger is creeping around you, right? That they're busy with activity, they're involved, and, and without realizing it, the waters in the caves around them begin to rise, and before you know it, they are in a life threatening situation. And it really was. It was a, a, a it, with all the technology we have, technology can't reach to that. I mean, they brought some technology with them and they medical staff and care, but what they had to do was they put together a team of cave divers and they divided the rescue journey into nine sections that was a total of three hours. Uh, one one of the divers said this, each child was sedated and then we carried them along, either on their back or their chest. They were wearing a mask, obviously. I had to have the lad really close to me because if you didn't, you were, you were bashing his head against the rocks. If we bashed him against a rock too hard and it dislodged the mask and flooded his mask, he was a goner. There was nothing we could do. So that's why we had to be very slow and careful about not banging them against the rocks. The visibility was so bad that we as the divers made sure at all times our head was higher than the child's head in the water in the cave so that if there was a rock for us not to see, our head would hit it, not theirs. What a picture of a team put in place for what? For a purpose, to be willing to care for a body of children who are in a crisis, to rescue them for the purpose of what? Sustaining their lives and giving them a future. And we rejoice. It's one of those, it's one, you know, there's not a lot of those stories in the news, right? You turn on the news, it's like, all right, okay, yeah, I know you don't like them and they don't like you and we know that and you're going to say this and, you're, and it can be very depressing, right? But it's, it was a great story. Well, I want to just take a little pause just today from Matthew's gospel to this story in the book of Acts because here in this passage, I believe we have a, a real life event in the early church that's kind of a, a picture of this. Oh, it's very different in its details, but a team is put in place to do what? To deal with a crisis, to sustain life and advance the future of the church and the gospel of Jesus. In Acts chapter 6, we read this in verse 1. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. We're going to pause for a moment and see where we are at this point. Remember what we're dealing with. This is the church of Jesus that has begun to explode on this planet. 
It's exciting. Exciting things are happening. If you turn back to Acts chapter 2, you'll see there in verse 41, so then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Wow. Wow. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness, sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is an exciting time. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, what do we read in Acts chapter 5 and verse 14? We read, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. Acts chapter 5 and verse 42. And every day in that temple from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. We can get very discouraged, understandably, when we look around at things that are happening. When we look at stories, when we look at things that are occurring, when we look at problems and troubles, we can very much find ourselves, oh man, it can be very discouraging. But there's something we need to remember. There is something eternally exciting going on right now. And it's been going on for 2,000 years. Jesus has been building his church. And it's the only thing that will last. The kingdoms will be shaken. But it is an unshakable kingdom, the kingdom of God. And, and, and sometimes you have to stop and go, wait a minute. Exciting things are happening. Because God is still building his church. And this is the very beginning of it we're reading about here in the book of Acts. The young church is exploding. Why? Because of the thrilling truth of their eyewitness message. What do we read back in chapter 2 and verse 22? In chapter 2 and verse 22, Peter is preaching. And Peter says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And go down to verse 32, right? This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. We go into chapter six, excuse me, chapter three and verse six, and uh, Peter and John have told a man to, to rise up and walk in the name of Jesus, and he has, right? And what do we see in verse six? But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, a real historical savior who we watched crucified, we watched risen from the dead. Chapter 3 and verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man. Chapter four, we get to, and in verse 10, what do we see them saying? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief corner stone. What's the point I'm making? They knew that their faith was built on a real Jesus. Listen, 
Jesus Christ is alive. He is real. It is exciting to know that's what they were built on. They had a real faith in a real Savior who they knew as eyewitnesses was crucified, buried, rose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And they are going forth with great excitement. This Savior is real. And they had a real message that he proclaimed. If you remember, we saw in Matthew a couple of weeks ago when Jesus says, so that you know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. The message that they went forth with was unique. There is complete forgiveness of sins available to any and all, not based on any merit of your own. None of us deserve forgiveness. Not based on any merit of your own, but it is in Jesus. Jesus proclaimed, I have authority to forgive your sin. And that's what they went forward with. That's the message they went out with in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Uh, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, or Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Whew. Chapter 3 and verse 19, what do we read? Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be, listen to this, wiped away. What a message. Chapter 4 and verse 12, what is it we read? And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. This is the message that has changed lives for centuries, and it's changed my life. I am only standing here today because I have been forgiven by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the only reason why I'm standing here. It, we are part of his real church built on the real Jesus with the real life-changing message. That's what we're all about. It's a message that's been translated in how many languages? It's a message that Keeley is uh, preparing to translate into a new language for people to hear. That it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you have done. The sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross is absolutely sufficient to pay for all of your sin. And that's what we celebrate. That's what we rejoice in. Oh, what it does for us every day. I stop and I go, I have eternal life. Why? Because of that message, the forgiveness of sins. For the wages of sin is death, Romans tells me. But the gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I have daily fellowship with God. Why? Because I never sin? No. Because when I sin, what do I know? I have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus. And if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. Hebrews chapter four. What, what powerful verse is there in Hebrews chapter four and verse 14. For we read there, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. See, see, the messages continue, and I know it's, this is the real Jesus who offers real forgiveness. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It is important that our confidence is only in Christ alone and in his message. For there is no confidence in ourselves. Paul reminds us of that when Paul speaks to the Corinthians and he kind of talks about this incredible thing that's happening that the God of all creation is 
has called us indeed to go forward with the message, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when he's talking about what it is that God has implanted in us, this incredible living Jesus, this message of forgiveness of sins. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, what does he say? He says, um, for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. And Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you know that the confidence is not in Vince. The confidence is not in Peter, the confidence is in God because we are earthen vessels. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8, what? He says, nor let us act immorally of some, as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. You see what I'm saying? This exciting church these broken people. And yet who has God, who is God using to take his message into the world? Earthen vessels. Imperfect witnesses. You are my witnesses. Who? People who better take heed if you think you stand because you're setting yourself up for a fall. God is using people like Peter who denied the Lord, and God put it out there on display for us to see. He denied the Lord, but God used that broken vessel to do what? To be the one who went forward with the message of Jesus, the real Christ, forgiveness of sins, and what? That God is bringing and building his church and bringing growth. The other disciples who were fighting over which one of them was greatest, those are the people God used. People like us. And because of that, God knows that sometimes our weakness gets in the way. Our weakness gets in the way of people seeing Jesus the Christ. Our weakness gets in the way of the message of forgiveness, our weakness gets in the way. We get tripped up by ourselves. We who carry the message of God forward. As a matter of fact, that's what we find when we go back to the book of Acts. You may say, I, I, I don't know where he is now because he started in Acts 6. But in Acts chapter 4, what did we read there? In Acts chapter 4 and verse 34, we saw that for there was not a needy person among them. They didn't have a needy person in the church. Everybody was being taken care of. And in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, what had we just read? Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of the food. This exciting, this thrilling new church as growth and activity is taking place and there's wonderful things happening. That lives are being changed. Tremendous growth and activity is happening. But as it's happening, nobody sees that the water is rising in the cave. Nobody sees that a crisis is developing. And something has changed when we get to verse 1 of Acts 6. It's the first complaint of discrimination in the body of Christ. It certainly wouldn't be the last. 
We have Hellenistic Jews and, and we have the Hebrews. The Hellenistic Jews are Jews who are using the Greek language and they have embraced the Greek culture. We have the, the Hebrews who are the Jews, but they consider themselves pure Jews because they're staying with Hebrew culture and, and language. And we have a problem developing here. And I think if you, any, of, any of us who have lived more than, well, I don't know, maybe even 10 years is long enough if you have brothers and sisters. Any of us who, who have lived that long, when you see, read this verse and a complaint arose, this group feels like they're not being treated like that, that, you immediately can see, oh boy, we know where this is going. We have been in situations like this before and where these kind of situations can sink to. Division. War. Whether it's personal relationships or countries or churches. We know what happens. Situations like this start pointing fingers. Fingers start getting pointed. The rhetoric starts getting much more aggressive. We start digging trenches. We start launching explosive devices and building bunkers. It may be this world leader antagonizing this world leader. It may be a husband and a wife. Believe it or not, it may even be a Democrat and a Republican. <laughs> Who would think, right? It may be a Christian and a Christian. War! War! Sometimes when I'm outside in these days and there's something about the, sometimes more in the evening, but you get that summer air. And I think, I, I, I think many of you would probably say this, sometimes that summer air takes you back to your childhood. You know, like just, because we, we, we just played a lot outside, right? For, you know, maybe for others, it's that air conditioning that takes you back to your childhood. For me, it was that summer air, right? And I can remember, I have this, this memory. It didn't happen a lot. I was one of the younger ones. I was trying to, have, when I was still able to hang out with Dan and Leo and, and the older guys on the block. And maybe it was during a wiffle ball game or maybe it was during something. And something would happen. And one of them would say, war. Didn't happen often. And the one group would go to Tad's screened-in porch. Tad had his, his, the best screened-in porch. And they'd go to the screened in porch. The other group would go to Wayne's family room because he had central air. And there were not many on our block in the 60s and 70s with central air. And I remember on this occasion going, running to Tad's. And the screen door was like, hey, you guys, come on, let me in. You're not with us, you're with them. No, no, I'm, all right. I run, I'll get the air conditioning at least. Run over to Wayne's. Oh, you guys, let me in. You're not with us, you're with them. <sighs> I was a man without a country, you know? I'm in the middle of a war, right? I'm in the middle of a war, right? I can laugh about that, but what I can't laugh about is sadly through the centuries, churches have fallen apart when they faced issues like Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. They have fallen apart. War! They take two sides and... There's some perhaps left in the middle saying, what happened to the church? What happened? How did we get our eyes off of the real Jesus? How have we forgotten the message of forgiveness? How did we get here? When you see it happen in a church, you think, oh, because that's the place where that's the message that's supposed to be going forward, right? In a body. The New Testament speaks to us about a process that Scripture calls sanctification. God takes us, we've we, we just seen this, God takes us broken witnesses and he takes us and says, go forward and share the message that Jesus is the real Christ, that there is forgiveness of sins for any who will come to him and that I'm building my church. Go forward with that message. Watch what I do. And as we go forward, what happens? He continues to mold us and change us because something happens. And I know you know this because I know it. A war happens 
The flesh inside of me lusts against the spirit. There's a battle. There's a war. Trenches are dug. The flesh lusts against the spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to us. We all have them. And the Holy Spirit comes as we're facing temptation. And he says, come this way. And by God's grace, we follow. But sometimes we don't. Sometimes we say, the temptation is too nice. And we go into the temptation. And then the Holy Spirit comes along and he says to us, you have sinned. Repent. And guess what? Forgiveness of sins. Turn back. Maybe the Holy Spirit sends somebody. Maybe somebody who has a burden and they come to us and say, I'm coming to you as a brother or sister. You need to turn back. And we turn back. And what do we find? We find that Philippians chapter one is true. That he who began a good work in you will perfect it. That he is using broken vessels like me. And as we're going forward with the message and our lives sometimes are getting in the way, he is doing what? He is sanctifying us. He is showing us that I will keep molding you and there will continue to be growth. I will sustain you. And what happens? I can tell you what happens in my life in those times. When I come out of them, having repented, having said, oh, Lord, Jesus all of a sudden just looks a little bigger than he did before I went into it. That message, forgiveness of sins, is just a little bit louder. And I say, wow, hallelujah, what a savior. Sometimes the situation is just in our personal lives. Sometimes it's in the body. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, this exciting, growing church. It's not a dead church. This is an exciting, growing church that is accomplishing great things in the message of the real Jesus, forgiveness of sins. God is bringing tremendous growth in their midst but they don't see that they are in danger of losing their focus. And if they do, the message of Jesus will get lost and the message of forgiveness will get silent. And so what happens? They bring the complaint to the leaders And we read, so in verse 2, the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. This is not the apostles saying, that's beneath us. That's not what they're saying. This is the apostles saying, we must continue lifting up the message of the real Jesus and forgiveness in his name. We must continue to keep letting God work in a way that brings growth, we must respond. There are different styles of leadership. How will they deal? There's the uh, Three Stooges School of Leadership. You know that one. Whenever they have a problem to deal with, Mo just bops everybody on the head, pokes them in the eyes, and pulls them around by their ears, right? And that's his style of leadership. There's an opposite style of leadership. You just ignore everything and you cover it up. Thankfully, that's not the apostle's style. The apostle's style, we see it here in verse 3. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of the task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And and these they brought before the apostles and after praying they laid their hands on them. 
Why? We said there in verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The, 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 the apostles are saying what? We need to give birth to new leadership. And guess who's born? A little child named Deacon. And it's the first time there's a deacon. And the church leadership now is the apostles and the deacons. His birth is given to that. For what purpose? That we have to address this issue so that we can do what? That we can continue to have the name of Jesus proclaimed. Continue to rejoice in his message of forgiveness of sins and continue to see God work. And what is the result? The result is there in verse seven. The word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Whew. What happened? Growth. He who began a good work in you will perfect it. And God brings growth in our lives personally. In the church body, as the crisis arose and they didn't realize it, right? A team is put together to rescue them from the rising water in the cave. And the result is what? God keeps growing. Keeps growing what? He keeps building a church full of imperfect people. He keeps building a church full of people who have their own personal struggles and issues that they must repent to him and grow in that process of sanctification. He keeps building a church of people who recognize that it is when our eyes are on Jesus and we are celebrating the message of forgiveness that we are loudest and brightest. Sometimes a crisis comes from persecution. Sometimes it comes from calamity. And sometimes it comes from sin. Every time, every time, the Holy Spirit wants to keep our focus on our great Savior. He wants to keep our message about his forgiveness. And he wants to show us how he will bring growth through it. That's what our God does.